Welcome to the online campus at Compass. Our mission is navigating people to God. We are one church in thousands of locations. That includes you from wherever you are tuning in from. My name is Brooks. I'm the online campus pastor, and I'm so glad you've decided to join us today for the experience. And I hope you've had a really great week. Maybe you are sitting in your kitchen having some coffee. Uh, let us know, by the way, in the chat what coffee you like. Um, you know, I am uh, New Orleans series creatures of habit. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. But I am a creature of habit because I really I usually get the same thing every single week. Uh, it's a caramel macchiato with almond milk. That's what I get every single week. Uh, that is my preferred coffee everywhere I go. I don't know why I don't get other types of coffee. That's just what I do. I am a coffee person. Uh, my routine in the morning is I wake up and I drink coffee. I spend time with Jesus and then I go off to work. Uh, well, I usually round up the kids too, but then <laughs> I go up to work. I get them ready for the day. But listen, uh, my wife is not a coffee person. She's actually a tea person. So let us know. Are you like a coffee person, tea person? Let us know what, what you are. I don't understand tea, to be honest. I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't get tea. Uh, I have family that love tea. My wife loves tea. It's, I don't get it. But anyway, hey, welcome to the Online Campus. We are in a series, like I said, called Creatures of Habit. And this series has been so good. Last week, we talked about anger. Now, this series, by the way, is based off this book sitting next to me called, you guessed it, Creatures of Habit, and it's by Steve Poe. Steve talked with us last week about anger. Such a, an interesting uh, topic because it's something that we don't really hear a, a sermon topic about, but it's something I think many of us struggle with is anger. Now, before we talk more about what Steve talked about and what we're going to hear today, uh, I would love for you, if you're maybe a first, second, or third time guest, why don't you go ahead, scan the QR code next to me, or click on the link in the chat. However you want to do it, click first time guest connection. I would love for you to fill that out. When you do that this week, one of my very favorite things is I love connecting with you personally. And listen, I want to give offer you some next steps here at the online campus. One of them being digital coffee. I love digital coffee. In fact, you can sign up for digital coffee now you scan the QR code and that's time where you and I can come face to face and, and just hang out for 30 minutes and I get to hear your story hear about your life and and listen what God may be doing and what he may be calling you to and maybe I, maybe we could pray together I don't know I love praying with people that are part of our online campus community but listen there are lots of numbers a lot of you that join us locally nationally and even internationally that have never joined us in the chat. So I've, I've had lots of digital coffees recently with people who have joined us. And it was the first time I put a face to the name. It was it was crazy. It was so cool. Uh, but there are many of you where I could put a face to the number. So I would love for you to sign up for digital coffee, but fill out a first time guest connection first. Uh, and then we could tell text you and we can pray and talk about that. Or you can go ahead and just sign up for it. Uh, listen, uh, the reality is there's a lot of you that I, I would love for you to join us in the chat. So put in a quick guest username as well at compasschurch.online or any of our platforms. Join us in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. It is so cool. And I love it. Pastor Drew loves it. We love seeing the people that are joining us from all over Texas, all over the country, and all over the world. So join us. Say hello. You, that's all you have to say. But we have chat hosts that are ready to pray with you, ready to encourage you, whatever situation or circumstance you find yourself in today. So make sure, fill out a first-time guest connection. I'll connect with you this week and then join us in the chat as well. Now, listen, uh, last week I said Steve Poe is here, the author of the book Creatures of Habit, which you can buy on Amazon. Creatures of Habit, it's all about, you know, we develop habits that didn't happen overnight. There are habits that we have in our lives that have taken years and years and years and years to develop. So how do we overcome these bad habits in our life? And we talked about anger last week. And so when it comes to anger, he, he talked about how we have to resolve our differences before the anger causes trouble. We have to, because anger is, ooh, it's a deep rooted thing that can fester and cause illness and sickness within you and in your heart and in your mind. 
Uh, and maybe some of you are like that. Maybe you were thinking about the message last week and you thought, you know what? Man, I was driving on the freeway and this guy got in front of me and it just, I just blew up. Or maybe I saw the, the length of the line at the grocery store and I just I lost my patience. And maybe you're somebody that's just always angry. Well, Steve Poe talked about how important it is that we've got to foster an identity rooted in love and grace and self-control. And when we begin to foster that identity, when we begin to give God the first fruits of our day and the first fruits of these habits that we've developed, over time, what happens? What happens is we end up finding ourselves becoming more identifying within Jesus. We identify ourselves in Jesus. We, see, we tend to see our habits and these things look more like Jesus when we give them over to him, right? We spend time in scripture, we spend time in prayer. Um, and we make, we, we choose to do the thing that maybe naturally we don't want to do. And so that's what we talked a little bit about last week. Well, today, Pastor Drew is in the saddle today. I'm so excited he's here because today he's talking about a topic that maybe many of us wouldn't consider on a list of habits to talk about, but it is probably one of the most important habits. And that is the habit of prayerlessness. How often as believers do we not put the highest priority on prayer? And what I mean by that is we, we don't think of prayer as the go-to for disaster. We don't think of prayer as the go-to for, you know, anything that happens in life. Or maybe we just, when we wake up, the first thing we do is we get on our phone and we start scrolling on Instagram, scrolling on Facebook. We don't spend time with the Lord before we do that. I read somewhere this week, I'm reading a great book, and they said that we view life through three pieces of glass, our TV, our phones, and our computers. That's how we view life now. So what if we kind of resisted that and instead put a focal point on God? And we began to put prayer as a priority in our life. What happens when we view prayer as an obligation instead, or as instead of a resource, really. What happens when we view prayer as an obligation and not a resource? Well, kind of go, going with that, here's the question I have for you all today, because I would love to see some engagement in the chat this morning, which by the way, I'll do some shout outs in a second, but I want to see your, your answers in the chat, okay? What was the last house chore you put off? What's the house chore you're just like, I'll do anything. I'll clean the bathroom. I'll clean the kitchen. You know, I'll, I'll scrub the toilets, but that thing I will not do. That's the thing I will put off all the time. I'll tell you what mine is. It is absolutely the case. And it's because I have three kids. It is laundry. I, I'll do, I do all the cooking and cleaning in our house because my wife works. And so it's kind of, you know, we have to balance that out. But uh, the laundry, I, for whatever reason, will see it. And I'll be like, I'm putting that off. I am not going to deal with that today. I do not receive that laundry at this moment. I need a minute before I tackle that. The laundry just piles up all the time. It's just this constant thing. So laundry is the one for me. But let us know in the chat, and what is the house chore you put off? Maybe it is scrubbing toilets. I don't know. Uh, but listen, that today is about prayerlessness and how we can overcome that. Now, I want to say hello to a, micro, or a McDermott microsite. What's up, McDermott? We love you all. Let us know in the chat, create a quick guest username, or if you are in the chat and you haven't said hello, say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, Pastor Drew loves to see, and I love to see all of you joining us and where you're where you're joining us from. So make sure you say hello and we can see him right now. And uh, you can see behind me, everybody's walking in, everyone's coming to church. We are live right now at Compass. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, we love you, Online Fam. We're about to jump into our worship, so make sure, Online Fam, you get some elements for communion, whether that is cereal, milk, coffee, and toast. Maybe you do have literally like wine and bread. I don't know what you got, but man, get a place to prepare where you can hear the Lord and you can experience His presence. We have powerful worship today, I'm telling you. It's, we got lots of great feedback on it last service, so make sure you're listening to the worship Make sure you're engaged today. We have chat hosts here that are going to be talking throughout the message with you. So make sure you're talking throughout the message too with us or chatting in the message rather. Would love to hear your thoughts throughout the message today as we jump into our uh, 
our uh, discussion on prayerlessness. Let's go ahead and jump into worship. Welcome to the online campus at Compass. Good morning and welcome to Compass. Our mission here is navigating people to God and we are one church in multiple locations. Thank you so much for being here. If you're joining us online, thank you for joining us this morning. Hey, before we continue in worship, we just wanna take one moment and turn and greet someone around us and then uh, we'll continue in just a second. So go ahead and do that.
You guys can have a seat for just a moment because right now we're gonna move into a time in our service that we call communion. And so to prepare well for that, if you're joining us in the room, you should have received one of these little communion packets on your way in. If you didn't, please raise your hand. We wanna get one of those to you so that we can take communion together here in just a moment. If you're joining us online, go ahead and head into the kitchen, grab some crackers, some juice, whatever it is that you would like to use for communion here in just a moment. But, but every single week here at Compass, we take time to pause and reflect back on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. You know, uh, there, there's this portion of scripture where he gathers around this table with his disciples, those closest to him, and he has this meal that is incredibly significant on so many different levels. But he lays out some stuff that's gonna happen. And he says, hey, this is the bread, which represents my body that's broken for you. And that, that's what's represented in this cracker at the bottom of this thing. If you peel it back, you'll, you'll get access to that. And, and then he passes around a cup of wine and he says, hey, this wine is representative of my, of my blood that's gonna be shed for you as well. And so that's what the juice represents for us this morning. And that whole episode is the perfect picture of the love of creator God wanting to actually be near to us. If you read throughout the Old Testament, there's all of these sacrifices and rituals and all of these different things to where the presence of God could actually be among his people. But then he actually puts on flesh and blood and comes down here for us. And then he doesn't stop there. He dies on a cross so that, that we could have access to him, so that we could draw near to him. And so that's what we get to celebrate in this moment. And so I'm gonna pray. And then I encourage you to take communion on your own time with that thought process, with that memory in your head. And so if you would join me in prayer. God, we thank you so much for the fact that you loved us enough that you, you didn't leave it to us to try to figure everything out on our own, but that you sent your only son down here to die for us so that we could have access to you so that we could draw close to you as we just sang about. And so God, we, we thank you for that. And we celebrate that in this moment. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. guy. I'm here at Dallas Christian College. I'm a student athlete, and I'd like to thank Compass for providing a scholarship for me. Grew up in, for four years, I was in South Sudan, and then we flew to Australia in about two, 2000, 2004, and I came here to study, uh, it's called liberal studies. I had minors of psychology, business, communications, and also uh, Bible is also one of our minors to kind of pursue more into my faith and just understanding the, the, the Bible and everything. And then here at, at Dallas Christian, I'm doing sports management. 
and looking to get into the grad program. In late fall, my scholarship had fell down and Compass had stepped in and helped me out, uh, provide a scholarship for me to help me pursue and continue on my studies. Being here at DCC has been a great privilege and getting the opportunity to get closer and build my faith with God has provided me with relationships and the opportunity to finish my, my classes here and, and finish up and provide back for my, for my city and my country, uh, country back home. I would personally like to thank just having Compass behind me and providing me with uh, a scholarship. It's helped me so much with just moving on with my career itself, studying, being in a closer relationship with God and um, just, I'm just grateful for that, yeah. Man, what an amazing thing. Listen, when you give to the online campus here at Compass, your impact is absolutely incredible. So we just want to say thank you so much for how you've supported you guy and his education. Listen, when you're generous here, I, I got to tell you, incredible things happen. God uses it for incredible purposes. You are training pastors. You are training ministry leaders that are going off into the business world through DCC. So we just want to say thank you. Thank you, online fam, for how you are generous. God is on the move here at Compass, and we're just so thankful and grateful for how you are involved with Compass, even at a distance. Uh, I love our online fam community. Uh, it is very unique in the church world. It really is. And so, listen, we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you guys. Uh, look, there's a couple of ways you can give. If you don't currently give consistently uh, through online, through our campus here at Compass, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can go to compass.church forward slash give, or you can download the Compass app. Find it on the App Store, Compass Church app, and you can give through that. But that app's great because it also shows you past messages, next steps, ways to get involved that sort of thing. So, hey, listen, I want to uh, say hello to some of you who have joined us in the chat recently, uh, especially during worship. We've got, you know, Steve and Stephanie and Teacher and Delena Rodriguez and Peggy. We've got Sherry in Los Angeles. we got people joining all over the place. And Heather, welcome, Heather. Heather, we're so glad that you're here today, Heather. Man, listen, one of my favorite things is that, I don't know if you guys saw this, but Heather decided to join Compass. She's now part of our Compass family. She's only joined us three times and she was like, this is my church. Heather, we're so glad that you're with us today. You're awesome. I just love it. And listen, if you're not joining us in the chat today, man, do it. I see so many of you logged in and many of you haven't said anything yet. So make sure you log in. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I love to see it. Pastor Drew especially loves to see it as well um, because it is so cool to see our online fam joining us, not just locally, but even nationally and internationally. You are part of this family. And uh, man, we want to see our family. We want to say hello to our family. We want to say hello to you. So make sure you join us. Now, you know, last week uh, we started our series, Creatures of Habit. And Steve Poe, the author of the book, Creatures of Habit, which you can buy on Amazon here, which the series is based off of, was here talking about anger. And he talked about how you've got to resolve the differences you have with other people and the things you're experiencing in life that cause that anger before it causes trouble, before it begins to fester and just kind of seep into the dark places in your life. And that's kind of how you live is on edge all the time, but, but instead trying to foster your identity and love and grace and self-control. Well, today, Pastor Drew is here to talk about the habit that we're all in, which is prayerlessness. I think many of us, I think all of us deal with this habit of not praying, like not having a consistent habit of prayer. So we're going to hear from Pastor Drew today. Make sure, by the way, you click the link in the chat to fill out a connection card. Would love to connect with you this week and see how I can pray for you. Maybe talk about some next steps with you here with our online fam. Uh, guys, so get some notes ready, get some to prepare uh, to take notes with. We're going to jump into our message now. Welcome to the online campus at Compass.
Well, good morning, 10 o'clock, how are you today? All right, sort of half in, but okay. Uh, welcome to Compass, our mission is navigating people to God. So glad that you're here today. My name is Drew, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if you're a guest with us today here at this service, we would love to connect with you out at Guest Gathering. Uh, would love to put a, a name to a face, have a gift for you. It's across from the fireplace in the lobby. If you're a guest online, we want to put that in the chat. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better and uh, just want to welcome our online community as well. Hey, before we begin, I want to just share something with you. Um, in our church, there is a couple, Homer and Marcy Murphy. They have been a part of our church since 1966. Um, they, were, they were there the first morning that this church began back in, back in October of 1966. Homer uh, went on to be with Jesus this morning, and I just wanted to share that with you all. We don't often talk about individuals up here. There's so many people that make up Compass and are a big part of it, but this is a very special uh, man of God, very special person, and uh, uh, we just want to encourage you to pray for that family. Uh, Homer has always been very supportive of my ministry, but most important, has just been a real big picture visionary uh, here at Compass. And so I just want to encourage you uh, to pray and uh, thank you for those of you that have been praying and those of you who have loved on the family over the years. They're a very important family to us. Marcy, of course, is still with us and just want to encourage you to be a part of that. Sorry, got some distractions here, but we're figuring it out. All right. Anyway, to set us up for where we're going today, I want to begin with an observation about human nature. This isn't a religious thing. It's just something you've experienced that perhaps you didn't have words for. And here's the observation. It's human nature to resist things that we can't control or don't understand. Now, this explains most of your conversations with your parents when you were in high school or college. You come home with new ideas and they resisted. It explains a significant percentage of your conversations with your kids if they're in high school or college. They came home with new ideas, new friends, maybe a new tattoo, and you had something to say about it, right? And much of this, in large part, it's okay, we can just do that. And much of this, in large part, has to do with preconceived views about how we think a particular experience is going to look, taste, or feel. I'll give you a real fun example. Uh, Brandon Beard, one of our executive pastors, some of you know Brandon, one of my great friends. I've known him for so long. We've been friends for over 30 years now. I attended his bachelor party. I'm not going to share details on that because I think the statute of limitations have been cleared, so we're good. Uh, but I knew Brandon when he was in his early 20s, and I attended his uh, big fat Greek wedding. His wife, Irene, comes from a, a Greek family, big Greek family, and that wedding was quite the adventure. Anyway, there's something about Brandon that I'll bet you didn't know. Uh, Brandon's never eaten pie. Can you believe that? Yeah. Can you believe that? Like he's never even tried it. Not apple pie, not banana cream pie, not, not blackberry cobbler. He's never had pie. Can you imagine going through life without pie? Seriously. You ever thought about that? Like apparently not, but I have a lot. And uh, I just think one of God's greatest gifts, he's never had pie. He just won't try it. He's just sure he won't like it. And I don't know if maybe as a baby, someone forced him to eat bad pie and he just has post-traumatic pie syndrome or something, whatever. He just won't eat it. But uh, there's more. My wife hosted a party at our house with all the pastor's wives oh, during the holidays a few years back. And Brannon's uh, wife, Irene, signed up to make cherry pie. And it was literally one of the best pies I've ever eaten in my life. And so I, I don't know if you're tracking, but his wife made the best pie like it was incredible. So he has access to the best pie and still, he won't eat pie, okay? I told you, I, I told Brandon recently, man, you need an MRI or something, right? He's in this service right now. I don't know. You are so wrong on this one. I mean, I'm just saying, you got to try some pie, man. Now, Brandon doesn't eat pie because he just doesn't understand how great it is. Can I get an amen from the congregation? That's right, because it's human nature to resist things we can't understand, and Brandon doesn't understand pie, clearly. Now, <laughs> I'm having so much fun with this. Uh, I want to talk to you today about prayer, okay? And I would submit to you that most people don't understand prayer. They've never really tried prayer. They've never seen it work. They've never seen its power. 
They have never seen its fruit. And as a result, they tend to stay away from it and forget about it or just plain resist it. Now, we're in a series of messages based on my friend Steve Poe's book called Creatures of Habit. Many of you have picked up a copy last week. I'm sorry if you missed out on that. We had 500 copies. We sold them out before the 1130 service. And honestly, uh, you can just get it on Amazon. I think it's even cheaper. Sorry about that. Anyway, (laughs) in this series, like a buck, sorry. In in this series, we're going to dig into some areas of life that can... uh, we can repeat for so long that they become bad habits. And if we don't deal with them, not only will they keep us from God's best, but they will become part of our identity and we can become known for those habits. James Clear wrote a book on, called Atomic Habits and he says, your habits are how you embody your identity. Your habits are how you embody your identity. For example, we may identify someone we work with and we say, oh, she's a real complainer, right? Or we may identify our friend, by the way, they gossip about others. Yeah, just know, here's what you need to know. They'll definitely talk about you behind your back. If you're, so be careful with the information you give them. So for better or worse, our habits can become the story of our life. And there's a verse in the book of Galatians that is gonna be sort of an anchor point for us during this series, uh, the next few weeks. It says this, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Because some of those cravings we have, the end game is often a bad habit. And we really need God's help with this. So today, I want to talk to you about the habit of prayerlessness. Now, maybe you didn't see that coming. It's a long word to be sure, but the meaning is simple. It's the habit of a life without prayer. A life without prayer. Now, at first glance, that might be a bit confusing because it's not something we do, but something we don't do. You see, not only are there sins of commission, which are the sins we commit, but there are sins of omission, or in other words, things we should be doing, but we neglect to do them. Prayerlessness is a sin of omission. F.B. Meyer, the pastor from England, said, the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer, unoffered prayer. That was profound to me, because prayer is our connection to God. It makes room for his direction as well as his correction in our life. Philip Yancey writes this in his book about prayer. He says, prayer is a declaration of dependence on God. And if that's true, and I believe that it is, what that means is that prayerlessness is a declaration of dependence on what? Self. You are essentially saying, I cannot trust God, so instead I'll trust myself. And that, of course, is a very dangerous road to travel on. And I wanna talk about the tragedy of unoffered prayer. And unlike most of the habits we're speaking of, this one is a little more dependent on you. But let me say this. Anyone, I think, can have an active prayer life. I don't know what your opinion of him is as an actor, and I'm not here to endorse his movies in any way, but I really appreciate Mark Wahlberg's prayer campaign these days. I appreciate this. Um, Because he is truly trying to escalate the need for prayer in our country. And I don't know if you've seen his commercials, but at the end of each commercial, he says, anybody know what he says? Stay prayed up, stay prayed up. Don't forget to pray. And honestly, it's a very biblical statement. In fact, I love this. If you look at that tiny little verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter five, verse 17, it says, never stop praying. Never stop praying. You might have memorized it as a kid, pray without ceasing. So Paul is saying, stay prayed up, stay prayed up. So here's my point. If Mark Wahlberg can do this, you can do this, okay? That's my point. Let's pray and we'll be out of here, okay? That's all I'm saying. If Mark Wahlberg can do it, you can do it. Prayer is like the air we breathe. It's our lifeline, it's our connection to God, and it sustains us spiritually. And I would say this, that all of us as Christians have probably experienced a season of prayerlessness. And I think there are basically two reasons that we often find ourselves in these seasons. Number one, I think, is our lifestyle. And number two, it's our beliefs. Okay? So there are many things about our lifestyle that contributes to this. One of them is is these, our smartphones. Okay? We have multi-billion dollar corporations who spend billions of dollars hiring the smartest and brightest minds in the world with one goal, to distract you and addict you and monetize your attention and modify your behavior. We live in the most distracted generation 
in human history. Personally, I remember this thing we had in the 80s called boredom. <laughs> Do you remember that? You know, when you're in a doctor's office, waiting room, you just wait it. <laughs> you just wait it. You read those highlights magazines that are 10 years old. You grabbed a copy of the 1973 Reader's Digest. When you were at your, in your car and you came to a red light, you were just at a red light. You didn't check Twitter, right? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we have almost entirely eliminated the moments in our lives that many of our predecessors in following Jesus would leverage for introspection and Bible study and prayer and scripture reading. And if that wasn't enough, for many of us, we have scheduled away another time we may have for connection with God, any other time. We're so busy, our schedules can be the enemy of our life. Another thing about that hinders us is our wealth, our wealth. We are the wealthiest generation in the history of the world. You, you, you may not be wealthy, but we collectively are wealthy. I heard one speaker recently say, we, why pray for your daily bread when you can door dash it, right? <laughs> It really does impact, uh, it can impact our prayer life. Uh, maybe you've allowed your priorities to get messed up. Uh, maybe it's because of an independent spirit and you hear God saying something but you don't wanna do that, so you stop praying. Maybe it's discouragement or resentment. Maybe you prayed for God to save your marriage and yet your spouse still left. Or maybe you prayed for God to heal a loved one and you still lost them. Maybe you've been asking God for a child, but nothing has happened. There's infertility. And since God didn't answer your prayer, or at least the way you wanted him to, you have this sense of betrayal. He's not a friend, right? He's an, an adversary, perhaps. So a lot of it has to do with our lifestyle. It can also be caused by unbelief. Uh, and there's a difference between disbelief and unbelief. Disbelief is to not believe in God, while unbelief is to reject or doubt the promises of God. So there's a difference. Disbelief is to not believe in God, while unbelief is to reject or doubt the promises of God. Sorry, not all this is on here because, well, not any of it is on here. <laughs> I'm a quick study, aren't I? <laughs> but you'll, we'll eventually get it up there on the screens for battling technology. So in Mark's gospel, we see this example of unbelief, just a real simple example. Um, we see a man bring his demon-possessed son to the disciples for help, and they tried to help, but they couldn't, they were unable to do anything, so the man went right to the source. He went to Jesus, and Jesus asked the boy's father, like, how long has he been like this? And, and the, the father said, oh, from, from childhood. He was, it often throws him into the fire or the water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity on us, please. And I love what Jesus says. He says, if you can do anything... <laughs> Like, everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, this is so honest, I love this, I do believe, help me to overcome my unbelief. So this father believed that Jesus was a healer, but he struggled to believe that he would heal his son. And all of us, all of us have been in this condition before. We believed in the power of God, but we weren't sure it was gonna happen for us. And scripture tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it's important to know that not only does God love us, but we can also trust him. When you are not praying, you're not hearing from God, and it clouds your heart to the temptations surrounding you. On the other hand, when you're spending time with God in prayer, it can strengthen your faith and flood your heart with joy. I love what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with this inexpressible and glorious joy. And so it's this idea that we are communicating with somebody that we can't see and it's kind of hard to get our arms around, but that's where faith comes in. And then at some point, Peter says, you have to take the relationship to the next level. And he goes on and he says this, you should cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So how do you cast your cares over to God if you're not praying, you can't, which is why a prayerless life will almost always, friend, lead to a more stressful life because you're doing life alone, which is no way to live. Another consequence of prayerlessness is you lose your hunger for more of God. It's like if you stop talking uh, to a close friend, 
that eventually you'll lose your desire to work on that friendship, that relationship. And the same thing holds true with your relationship with God. If you stop talking to him, the relationship will tend to break down a little bit. Um, for absence, we have, this, we have this saying, right? This axiom, absence makes the heart grow fonder. I don't think that's true in this context. I think absence makes the heart grow distant when it comes to our relationship with God. Prayer is the way that we communicate with God and communication is the basis of life. And it all comes down to this. Prayer is this good thing, this good gift that God has given us. And James talks about this. He says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now, I know that's a really bold statement coming from my mouth here today, thinking about that prayerlessness would actually be sin. But think about this. Um, it's always fascinating to me when I study the Gospels. I often overlook the little things that Jesus did. I want to go right to the water to wine and all the amazing miracles and the raising Lazarus from the dead and all of that. But oftentimes what we do is we overlook the little things. Jesus always made space for prayer. In Luke 5, it says this, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. So Jesus, perfect as he was, made space for prayer. He made time to talk to the Father. The prophet Samuel, when he confronted the people of Israel for their sin of rejecting the leadership of God by wanting a king, they cried out under conviction, please pray for us. And here was his response. This is so powerful. He says, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. So in his context, Samuel says, it was my responsibility as a shepherd to pray for you. And it would be sin if I didn't pray for you. Billy Graham warned about the dangers of prayerlessness. He says, we are to pray in times of adversity, lest we become faithless and unbelieving. We are to pray in times of prosperity, lest we become boastful and proud. We are to pray in times of danger, lest we become fearful and doubting. We are to pray in times of security, lest we become self-sufficient. You see, Billy Graham, Jesus, and Mark Wahlberg, they all do have something in common here, okay? They're telling us, all of them, never stop praying. I heard a story of a pastor who asked his church to pray that God would shut down the neighborhood bar. So the entire church gathered to, for a prayer meeting and uh, to pray against this. And a few weeks later, lightning struck the bar and it burned the bar to the ground. And the owner of the bar heard about the prayer meeting. And he decided to bring a lawsuit against the church. And they stood in front of the judge. And the owner argued that God struck his bar with lightning because of the prayers of this church. And the pastor admitted that they had a prayer meeting for that purpose. But that no one in the congregation actually expected anything to happen. <laughs> and so the judge leaned back to his chair. And he just shook his head. He said, I can't believe what I'm hearing. We're in strange territory here. I have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and a pastor who does not. <laughs> Sometimes we pray, but we don't really expect God to answer our prayers. We have a false impression of who God is. Uh, one of my favorite writers, John Tyson, writes, unless you break the stronghold of false images of God in your mind, you'll never be drawn deeper in prayer. And what that means, friend, is that some of us, we have this view of God and it's a very limited view of God. And so we tend to not trust God in that. And there are a lot of Christians who say they believe in the importance of prayer, and yet their actions would show otherwise. On the other hand, there are some Christians who want to pray, but they feel like they don't know how to pray. For instance, the disciples in Jesus' time were so discouraged by their own efforts to pray that they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. They had watched Jesus, and it just seemed like every time Jesus prayed, something happened. He turned water into wine. He gave sight to the blind. Uh, they were there, and they saw him feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. They saw him raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. Jesus' prayers were effective, and they, and they wanted that in their life. And notice the disciples didn't ask him how to teach. They didn't ask him how to forgive or how to do miracles. They wanted to learn how to be more effective in their prayers. And I think Jesus was effective in his prayers because he spent time doing it. And everything within us wants to follow our own selfish ambitions and the lure of this world. But prayer is what keeps us centered and focused on God. It's an act of obedience. It's a declaration of our dependence on the Lord. Prayer is what drowns out the noise and confusion of the world. 
And yet, until we realize how desperately we need him, we probably aren't going to spend a lot of time in prayer. And so with the remainder of our time, I wanna stay within the spirit of what Steve, if you were here last week, Steve talked about the fact that the front half of all of these messages will be sort of context and teaching, and then the back half, the next few minutes, will just be steps to take in order to help with this habit. And we're gonna get into some real practical stuff. Next week, we're talking about lying. The following week, we're talking about complaining. Uh, So we're getting really practical. And I know today maybe was not what you expected, but I wanted us to get a little jolt here about this. And so I want to spend the next few moments kind of talking about how do we break this habit of prayerlessness. And the first thing before we get to our steps is I would just say it's important that we acknowledge, acknowledge the fact that we are not spending as much time in prayer as we should. And then once we have confessed that to God, ask him for the motivation to change. I think that's just a simple thing that will get us started. So let me just kind of walk you through this. There's probably 100 steps, but here are five that that we kind of came up with. And if you read the book, I think these are in there. Number one, identify your obstacles. Oops, it's not there. (laughs) I'm so used to having it. Identify your obstacles. Like, this has been a big obstacle for me today. Uh, In other words, what are the things that are keeping you from prayer? Do you have a hard time concentrating when you pray? Your mind drifts off to other things, or maybe there are things that upset you so much you find it difficult to pray about them. Maybe uh, you have unresolved conflict in your life, or there's unforgiveness in your life. Listen, if every time I pray, the Holy Spirit convicts me of my unforgiveness, I will either deal with the unforgiveness or I will stop praying. Once you identify your obstacles and get them out of the way, it will become much easier to break the cycle of prayerlessness in your life. Secondly, this is so important, schedule a time to pray. Schedule a time to pray. Uh, Life can get really busy, so I know if I want to have a healthy marriage, I have to schedule time alone with my wife or we will drift apart. Well, the same thing is true in my relationship with Jesus. If I don't schedule time alone with him in my relationship, it'll suffer. So I have to be proactive and schedule a daily time of prayer. Now, some Christians will tell you, oh, you have to pray at least one hour a day. If you don't pray at least one hour a day, you're not really talking to God. And listen, if that's what you elect to do, I think that's fine. That's great. If you have that time, do that. But prayer, friend, is not measured by minutes or hours, but by the attitude of the heart. It's not measured by minutes or hours. I don't even think God really knows. He knows but he doesn't really think about time all that much like you and I do. We think about time all the time. I don't think God thinks about time. Prayer is not measured by minutes or hours, but by the attitude of your heart. We are not responsible uh, in this matter to another Christian with a stopwatch, but to the Father who knows our hearts and the depths of our desires. I think the secret sauce to a successful prayer life is having a dedicated time each day to get alone with God which is why I have to be intentional to make it happen. My friend and yours, Laura Collins, you guys know most of you, if you're around Compass Colleyville, you know Laura Collins, she's awesome. Uh, one of our teaching pastors, she's teaching today at, at the North Richland Hills campus. But she talks about a prayer tactic that she uses called habit stacking. Habit stacking. And it's a tool used to build healthy routines where you stack the habit that you want to develop into a habit that already exists in your life. For example, um, I know every morning I'm going to drink coffee, right? That's not going anywhere. Trust me, right? I got to have coffee before I can even speak, okay? So I started stacking prayer into my morning habit of drinking coffee. did this morning. I prayed um, for the Murphy family. I prayed uh, this morning for Israel. Of course, they're going through an unthinkable time. And I prayed for my family. And, you know, I I will pray as I make coffee and pray as I drink coffee and pray to God for more coffee, right? (laughs) Uh, so, so habit stacking. Maybe yours could be your drive into work or after, after work, dropping the kids off at school. You, you, a drive is going to happen every day. So what if you stack the habit of prayer onto that time? I think that's habit stacking. Another easy way, stack your prayer with your meal times. No matter what happens in life, you will be eating something every single day. It has to happen. So what if you stacked prayer with your meals? Um, you, could, you could look at it like this. What if you did this? Okay, this is just an idea. Okay, here, it's not there. It's up here. <laughs> what if at breakfast you prayed the Lord's Prayer? I'll explain that in a moment. What if at lunch you uh, prayed over a few people? 
Uh, you could pray through the Lord's Prayer at breakfast. And then at lunch, you could simply pray by name for people. You could put a notification on your phone that goes off every day at noon with a list of current people to pray for. It doesn't have to be lengthy. Uh, the prayers don't have to be long, out, long drawn out prayers. But it's simply time when you pray uh, and bring names before God and ask him to intercede on their behalf. Maybe at dinner, you could give thanks to God for the day. And, and uh, so I just think habit stacking. I think it would be really helpful. Just, just try habit stacking. Third, find a prayer partner. Praying with your spouse or finding someone to pray with on a regular basis can help you uh, have the accountability you need to stick with it and break the habit of prayerlessness. I think that's why Jesus encourages us to pray together. When you pray with someone else, your prayers are no longer all about you. Uh, a prayer partner will help you to focus on each other's needs as well as the needs of others. Jesus said in Matthew 18, again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything that they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So get a prayer partner, someone you trust. If it's not your spouse, it'd be wise for you, probably a trusted friend, maybe of the same sex, because you need to be open and honest with each other and share the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to praying. Number four, use an outline. Use an outline. I can be a little ADD at times when it comes to prayer. My mind has a tendency to drift to the things I need to get done. So I find it helpful to use a prayer formula or an outline. I'm gonna suggest three to you. I think there's a whole bunch of them. But here, here's just three. And I just wanna tell you, there's no shame in the outline game, okay? This can really help eliminate distractions. So I just talked to you about the Lord's Prayer what if you prayed that but used it as a format? Let me explain what I'm saying. Let's read the Lord's Prayer in the English Standard Version. And uh, why don't we just do it out loud together? Can we put it on the screen? Yeah, let's do it out. It was there. Now it's gone. There we go. Okay. Let's recite it together out loud. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, this is a great prayer straight from Jesus, but I'm not sure he just wanted us to recite it word for word. I think we can. I think it's great. But I believe Jesus was giving us a little hint to an outline of how to pray. How so? Well, uh, let's go ahead and put that prayer back up there. And then let me just explain. Maybe as you kind of follow the prayer, maybe first we just find a way to thank God for being a good father and for providing for us and caring for us and listening to us. And then we remind him that he is, ourselves, that he is holy and that he is, needs to be worshiped for it. And we worship his name. Uh, we ask for his will to be done in our life and in our family, in our children, in our church, in our community, in our country. Uh, and then we, I think it's good to share prayer requests that are on our heart and ask him exactly for what we need for the day. Not necessarily what we want, but what we need. And we bring our requests before him. And then we, I think there's time to ask for forgiveness uh, that we've committed, sins that we've committed recently. And maybe take a moment to forgive others that we are bitter towards or that have sinned against us. And then a time to ask for protection around ourselves and our family and our friends and our church. So I just think you could use uh, the Lord's Prayer as a way to pray out loud or pray um, in your quiet time, uh, and it's a good format. Uh, also, I used to use this. I don't know, if maybe some of you have used the Acts Prayer Method. Acts Prayer Method. And it's real simple to remember. Uh, it's an acrostic with the book, the word of, the, the book, sorry, the word Acts. So the first part is adoration, to acknowledge His holiness, and his goodness, sort of a time to adore the Lord, and then confession, so a time for repentance and confession of sin, and then thanksgiving, just a time to express our gratitude, and then finally supplication, or what is our request? What's on our heart? What is it that we're worried about? What is it that we're anxious about? What is it that we feel that we need? And so I think that's a good prayer method. I also wanna take you back a moment to the series we did called Sound Mind, remember, where I encourage you, if you weren't sure how to pray, pray through the Psalms. There are 150 Psalms. Most of them are relatively short until you get to Psalm 119, and it's really long, so you might break that one up. But you could read, uh, that, that could be almost 
nearly close to a half year of prayers that are already written out for you. And if you're not sure what to pray, you can use Psalms as a prayer outline. And then every time you read something and it convicted you, you could stop and make a comment on it as you were talking out loud to God. So there's really no wrong answer, whether you're doing the Lord's Prayer or Acts or praying through the Scripture. Just find a model or an outline that works for you and just give it a try for a couple of weeks and see if it resonates with you. If it doesn't, just try another one until you find one that really helps you grow in this habit of prayer. Okay, let me give you one more. Um, pray with boldness. Pray with boldness. You don't have to look far in Scripture to find numerous examples of people praying bold prayers. Think about Moses standing in front of the Red Sea, asking God to deliver them from the Egyptian army. Think about Joshua praying that God would help the Israelites in their battle and cause the sun to stand still. Uh, one of my favorite examples of a very bold prayer is that of the mother of James and John in Matthew chapter 20. This mother did not ask her sons, uh, didn't ask if her sons could one day be the door holder for Jesus. She asked if they could be at the right and left sides of Jesus up in heaven. Now that's a very bold prayer. And many think she stepped over the line. I don't think that. Uh, what loving mother hasn't gone the extra mile in trying to achieve the best for her kids? God may or may not answer your prayers in the way you want, but Scripture tells us that bold prayers are exactly what the Lord wants from us. One of the boldest prayers Jesus ever asked us to pray was when Jesus told us to pray for our enemies. He told us to pray for our enemies. That's a hard prayer to pray. I was recently rereading the incredible life work of Corey Ten Boom recently. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's called The Hiding Place. It's this incredible story of Corey and her sister Betsy as they endured uh, incomprehensible suffering at the Nazi concentration camp in Germany during World War II. We often look to Corey as our hero in the story uh, and she had unspeakable courage, but it was actually Betsy who often took the high road spiritually when they were pressed and persecuted. There is a man in the story named Jan Vogel. Jan Vogel. He was largely responsible for Corey and Betsy's imprisonment. And so he essentially ruined their life. And for a long time, Corey hated him for that. But her amazing sister Betsy would remind her, Corey, if people can be taught to hate, they can also be taught to love. And Betsy taught Corey to pray for her enemies, but praying for Jan Vogel felt impossible for her. She had murdered him in her heart a million times over. But one night, in her humility, she forced herself to pray for her enemy. She prayed this prayer. It's right there in the book. Lord Jesus, I forgive Jan Vogel as I pray that you will forgive me. I have done him great damage. Bless him now and his family. And then she writes this, that night for the first time since our betrayer had a name, I slept deep and dreamlessly until the whisper summoned us to roll call. Praying for her enemies cleared Corey's conscience and drew her closer to Jesus. So powerful. One of the things I love most about prayer, and if you don't remember anything else, I hope you remember this. There is no greater way to demonstrate love than to pray for someone. There's no greater way. In godly intercession, we lift the needs of another to God and watch as he moves to meet needs and provide for the one we're praying for. Through prayer, bodies are healed, families are knit together, individuals are saved, churches are revived. When we withhold prayer on behalf of others, we demonstrate hardened hearts and a failure to love them enough to bring their needs before a loving Father. So friends, if you want prayer to be a way of life, then the only thing left to do is practice praying. Not just when you're in a crisis, but every day of your life. Always remember that a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. So we should probably pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, this is a very personal one today. And I think many of us probably right now are going to have a tendency to feel guilt. I pray that that's not the reaction. I pray, honestly, that there's a little bit of anticipation, a little bit of excitement about praying more. And so, Lord, we'll just ask the same thing of you as the disciples ask of you. Lord, would you teach us to pray? 
you teach us to pray? And as we pray, would you challenge us and give us the energy and the motivation to want to pray more? Because we know, we know the power of prayer is real. So Father, we pray that we would not fall into this habit of prayerlessness, but that we would have a prayerful life and prayerful hearts. And uh, Jesus, we thank you for the power of this and that you are a God that is willing to be in relationship and friendship with your people. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. And what an amazing, amazing message today from Pastor Drew. You know, one of the things that I took away was a prayerless life is a stressful life, isn't it? That's absolutely the case. A prayerless life is a stressful life life. Share your takeaway in the chat, by the way, would love, absolutely love to see what it is you took away from this today. But let's, guys, let's make it a habit of, of let's place habits of prayer in our life. Uh, one of the things that I do is I actually have three alarms that go off throughout the day, a morning, evening, or morning, afternoon, and night. Would love for you guys to do maybe that same thing. Maybe that's what you need. It's just a, a reminder of what, of when to pray. Maybe you have got a prayer closet. Find a place where you can just hear from the Lord, a quiet place. That's what I have as a prayer closet. Man, make prayer a priority and watch what happens. Watch how God moves and acts. Now, before you log off, before you continue on with your Sunday, would love for you to fill out a connection card, scan the QR code next to me, or you can click on the link in the chat. However you want to do it, fill out first time guest connection with love to connect with you this week and pray with you or we let's get let's get coffee let's get a digital coffee together scan the qr code click digital coffee schedule time with me i would love to sit down with you hear your story and pray with you as well well guys thank you so much for joining us here make sure you join us next week as we continue in our series creatures of habit so good sherry so good to see you heather p really glad to see you're part of the online fam the krebs family that joined us we love you guys thanks for joining us krebs fam uh, guys have an amazing week take care god bless